Welcome back to the garage, everybody. Just doing a little maintenance on Rango today. Thought I'd take you along for the ride. Uh, really bright out. Got some tie rod ends here. And uh, I noticed that when I was kind of, ooh, that dark, pulling uh, Rango out of the mothballs, if you will, um, tie rod ends were a little bit loose uh, or starting to get loose. They're not bad yet, but so I ordered a fresh set and uh, gonna swap those in. Shouldn't be too big a deal. Um, shoot, these things have been on there, um, shoot 12 years almost. So yeah, um, just quick remove and replace hopefully. And I uh, thought I'd take you along for the ride. So, so I don't really know what to share with you guys and what not to share. So I guess this will just be a little bit different format because I get to kind of just tinker and I don't really have to do anything super crazy. Um, but anyways, just kind of go through my process on this stuff and show you kind of what I do and how I tackle this stuff. in my thought process and maybe I do things a little bit different than how you would or whatever else. So I don't really want to have to do too much of this. Oh, um, I don't want to have to get it. Oh, shoot. I don't know if it ever, ever was really aligned per se, but uh, I didn't want to don't want to have to reinvent the wheel either here. So, um, I'm just gonna take some measurements before I get started here on the old stuff from, uh, end to end. And, uh, that way I'll have a good reference point for when I pull these things out and I can just write that down and hopefully it saves me a little bit of time so the tie rod is right about 42 and three quarters 42 and three quarters This old Jeep has sure been fun. It's probably my, still my favorite thing that I've ever built. And it was kind of the first thing that I really had built or really built from the ground up. And, uh, you know, I've slowly made some improvements in it. Um, but overall it's, it's kind of stayed very similar to how I originally built it. And I never really changed that much. So we're looking at 28 and three quarters, 28 and three quarters. So I guess that's kind of the hardest part, right? Is finding the vehicle that you just kind of love and can keep mostly interested in and all those things. And that was darker than I wanted. Let's see if I can get you guys a different view. How about on that side? A little better, maybe, kinda. This is more about me talking than anything. Um, but yeah, so I just wrote the, just a couple pieces of tape and just wrote the old measurements for the tie rod and drag link down. So when I was, when I take them off and everything, um, be able to get things back where they belong and whatnot. And, uh, these aren't anything fancy really. Um, it was, uh. 
it was just uh so this axle is a like an early 70s um, drum brake narrow track dana 60 that i converted to disc brakes with my and some of the first of the tracker um, sidekick conversion plates that i did when i did all the development for that um, yeah so pretty basic axle it's got alloy shafts in it with the bigger um u-joints in it uh a spartan locker 538 gears um, but overall pretty stock they're a good fit for these old jeeps and i think this was you know a score off of uh off craigslist and it was uh i think i paid 100 and 50 bucks for it back then and it actually did have and the reason why I bought this one versus a different one was um, this one actually did have um, 427 gears or in it or 430s I think there were 427s in the Dana 30 but anyways I had that ratio in the rear axle um, when I originally built it and so I was trying to match the rear axle that I had and so that was um, what I needed and uh, found this one, I think pretty local. I think it was down in, I think it was in Farmington or something like that, but pretty close. So, and then I tried the 430 gears. I'll just call them 430s. Um, with the 35 inch tires when I originally built it and I wasn't super happy with that. So it was, a, um, it had an SM420 in it when I first built it. It now has a Dana 18, um, it's that much different or whatever, but, um, the 430 gears and a granny four speed was not my favorite um it just ended up having a very large ooh, got one gap between um third and fourth gear and so you couldn't if you couldn't pull it in in uh fourth gear which living at elevation in colorado is a decent amount of things even just the kind of roly-poly type stuff um, it it was like totally wrapped out in in third gear even with the 430 gears and so I, I just didn't didn't like that combination really and so I ended up um, changing it to 538s and I think honestly for flat fenders and early Jeeps, even ones that you're going to drive, you know, call it on the road. Um, that's just fine. Like I don't, I don't think these things are really going to go 80 down the road. Um, and not just for gearing reasons, but for aerodynamic reasons and noise and a whole bunch of other stuff. It's just not, I know there's some out there that do it. Um, I just don't really see the point. Um, but if somebody else wants to do that, that's fine. Um, you know, just not my thing. I think the, uh, the 538s are just fine. And with a um, with a granny four speed and the stock gearing, I don't really see too much need for anything different. It's different to be fun. It's fun to be different. And if you want to do something different, by all means. Um, but I don't, I think it works just fine how it is. Um, you know, having a little bit 
lower gearing in the transfer case might help some situations might hurt you in others so i don't know if there's a if it's worth it or not i mean these are just for fun though so you know if that's what you want to do then by all means i'll probably tinker with that at some point myself but i think for just a like if you want to build a flat fender that just works well and isn't super expensive but you want something more than stock i think a i think a v6 doesn't matter which one really uh, there's lots of good ones out there just in the v6 world if you wanted to just build v6 flat fenders for the rest of your life you could probably have enough choices that you'd never run out of flat fenders to build um, but i think a v6 especially these days because I think the V6s, especially some of the newer stuff, is as powerful or probably honestly more powerful than anything that was swapped in years ago. As far as V8s, you know, the old two barrel small block Ford and GM stuff and whatever, you know, those weren't making 500 horsepower or anything like your buddy says. They could if you put enough money into them and that kind of stuff but i think uh v6 is just about perfect for these things and that's you know call it anywhere between a what 150 horsepower and um shoot i mean there's v6s now that make 300 horsepower from the factory so i don't think it's i think that's enough of a range that keeps everybody happy heck you could do you know twin turbo who knows what's it stuff and make a whole bunch of power but packaging wise i think the V6 stuff is just fine. Granny floor speed, again, don't really care which one you use. They're all kind of have their pluses and minuses. Um, I think if you already have something, like sitting in your barn or whatever, just use that. But if you're shopping, my preference, so if it's a, I would say if it's a Ford, uh, I don't even know if that's true. I would say my preference generally is oh where'd that go um i like the t18s i think they package about the best out of all of them they're pretty narrow pretty short you can get a factory uh adapter for them so the trick the old trick new trick, whatever, old trick. So you could get them, T18s came with Dana 20s a lot in full-size Jeeps, uh, some CJs, later CJ stuff, whatever, and you can, um, you can use that Dana 20 adapter to go to a Dana 18, which is what most of these old Jeeps come with. Um, and I think it, that's another thing that packages better than a center drive transfer case like a 20 or a 300. But the Dana 20 adapter, you can build a Dana 18 in a 20 case. It's called kind of like, it used to be called kind of the Super 18 
kind of thing. Um, that works out pretty well. Um, kind of gets you a, a low cost adapter. Um, that stuff's getting harder to find these days, but you know, is what it is. Uh, this might be a little loud. I'm sorry, guys. Let's see if I can. Oh, might have to use a puller. I don't feel like smacking on things more than that. Um, so, uh, what were we talking about? We were talking about. kind of transmission transfer case stuff. So I like 18s, uh, SM420 is, or sorry, SM465 is probably my next favorite, if you will. Um, I don't know if you guys ever, you guys use these, just these little pickle fork or not pickle fork, but uh, presses for tie rod ends. I know you can sometimes smack the end of the knuckle or whatever with a hammer but i don't i'll do that like once or twice but i'm not going to sit there and get a bigger hammer and all that stuff i just uh grab one of these and do it this way and that usually works just fine One. I will try this one because it's kind of in a hard to get to place. Two. I need a paper towel. my little light. Hope you guys can still see everything. Must have not been charged up all the way. Sorry guys. Oh. But uh, yeah, V6, four speed, T18 is fine. Stock ones are fine. I do like the bigger shaft versions if you can get them. Um, but again, it's not the end of the world. It's just a buck. It's just parts. Like, I don't really care what people use. I would rather have them get it together, get it out on the trail instead of trying to be completely different. And, you know, the amount of projects that don't make it past kind of the, oh, there's three, they kind of don't never make it out of the garage. Um, just, you know, these are, these are supposed to be fun little cheap rigs and keep them, keep them fun little cheap rigs. Like I built this thing all off of, all of when I was, you know, much poorer, if you will. Um, and so like, it was all just Craigslist used stuff and that's fine you know, rebuild what you can and you can't just get it going and get it in there and have fun with it. I mean, I, you know, like there'd be people that are going to be like, why aren't you using one ton tie rod ends and you know, all that stuff and whatever. And honestly, it, I just don't think it needs it. So this is, these are all just original, you know, not original, but I guess they are OE style um, tie rod ends from like a CJ7 or CJ5. Now, the same, the basically the donor vehicle for the front end. And uh, these have been on here for, uh, <laughs> that might be fun. These, uh, these are, and this is the first time I've had the tie rods off with, um, 
no, no, there it goes. It, I was gonna say it's the first time I think I've had this tie rod off with the newer springs that I put in. Um, but it still came off. So these are, uh, you know, one ton tie rods, whatever, make it bigger, stronger, yada, yada, yada. And you can, um, but my data point on it is that these are, or were, um, factory, you know, at the, the lower end of aftermarket, uh, tie rod ends for a CJ5, CJ7, um, stock stuff that where they're configured in the stock might be a little bit different, but basically it's the short, um, the short tie rod end left and right threaded. Um, and then, uh, just some, some one inch, uh, DOM tubing three sixteenths wall. And then that is nearly the perfect size for the threads, um, which I think is 11 sixteenths threads, if I remember right. Um, it's been 12 years since I did this, so forgive my foggy memory. But anyways, um, it was a really easy way to make stronger but cheap and good enough tie rod ends. Um, you know, you wouldn't even need a lathe to do it. You could do it in a vise. Um, basically, you just have to kind of run a, a, I think it was a 5 8 drill bit kind of to clean up the ID of the hole, and then you could run the tap down um, directly. Um, and the one inch tubing you, was just uh, cheaper, like, um, what would it be, A513 or whatever, um, DOM tubing, but uh, that's still pretty strong stuff. Um, not you know, um, super duper strong, but it's been strong enough for big, dumb 35 inch tires. And, um, you know, all the things this thing's done in the last 12 years, I've, I haven't bent a, bent a tie rod or, um, drag link on this thing, at least not enough to make a difference. And, uh, you could use, if you wanted to spend more money, um, you could do one inch, you could do a chromoly tubing in the same size that would be stronger and then you could even get them um, heat treated if you want. Um, but anyways, uh, these these tie rod ends lasted me for 12 years and they're still actually okay, but I did notice a little bit of, of wiggle and slop in them um, when I did the new steering box. Uh, so I uh, put it off for a season or whatever and uh, now I'll just replace them. It's like, you know, they're $15 a piece or something. They're nothing super crazy. You can get them at any parts house and uh, Yeah, so let's get these things torn apart. Put some new parts in them All right, I got to take you guys over put you on somewhere different probably Hold on, maybe we'll do this part in a time-lapse because I'm kind of tired of talking for a minute. All right, we'll time-lapse you lost you guys so that went pretty easy just getting the old tie rods off I did notice that I uh, I didn't do anything about marking which one was uh, left and which one was right um, so I made sure to remember that when I put them together and I'm just gonna chuck these up in the lathe here real quick hopefully and uh, just make a little witness mark um, on the end of the link so that now I'll know and that way when you're under there you know it's shoot even if it's dark or something like that you won't be 
won't be wondering which one's which and all that stuff trying to go the wrong direction and whatnot so <laughs> put a little, I don't know if you can see that, very good witness mark on the end of them. So nothing too crazy, but will help me remember which, which one's which in the future. don't do one of these things but my lathe is pretty tight to the wall and to move it out takes a bit so I'm just gonna hang this thing way out here and just put a little mark on it details I think they add up over time but so yeah I wonder kind of wondering if I still have taps for these oh hey sorry guys Do you want to look at my UA shirt I swear the best part about going on ultimate adventure um, now it's uh, unreal adventure still run with a lot of the same great guys but um, when I did it I did it two years and they give you uh, so many t-shirts that you never will ever 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 run out of shop t-shirts again pretty much so um, yeah it's kind of silly but Anyways, I'm gonna see if I can find the old taps in my very messy toolbox and see if I can just chase those threads. Uh, since I got everything apart. Three quarter inch taps, I don't think that's them. Sixteenth, eighteen. I'm guessing that's one of them. Look how all rusty sitting in the case. I don't know if that was in my toolbox for a while or something. For a trip, and I'm not seeing. big deal but I think it's about time to buy a bigger toolbox but I have small garage problems so
Got my three quarter sixteen left and right hand, but I do not see an eleven sixteenths eighteen left hand anywhere in here. A tapered reamer. Well, I guess I'll have to order another one of those. Handy to have. I like those tie rods are good tie rods. But I can chase all the right hand threads, and that's something. Magic, magic pro tap. Tap arm is not big enough. Wheel. No big deal. These are actually in pretty good shape, seems like. Clean up on the one side, do what we can, since we couldn't find that other tap, but... At least get anything out of there that... Might cause a problem in the future, and then we'll... Anesthesize all this stuff. Put it all back together again and be good. Well, let me know if you guys like this kind of video. Me just kind of farting around in the shop and talking about it. Might be able to share a little history and stuff with you and whatnot. A little bit longer. Eh, got a couple little chips out of there. Probably just from the very bottom, but. Good enough. At least we know. Um, yeah, so let me know if you like this kind of longer format stuff with my head cut off. That's kind of totally unprofessional, right? But talk about stuff maybe a little bit if you guys aren't completely annoyed with my voice like I am on uh, <laughs> when, when I try to watch my own videos. It's, I don't know, it's just one of those things like I don't like the sound of my own voice, especially on, on video. And so I try to keep it pretty level and that stuff, the... Uh, the editing software I use, so I friendly tip if you're trying to do the YouTube thing at all. Um, 
I use the free version of CapCut for desktop, which is actually quite good. Um, I don't think many people realize they have a desktop version. Um, I can't, honestly, I can't do any editing hardly at all on mobile devices. Uh, the screen's just too small, it's not my thing. Um, but uh, the CapCut version on the desktop is actually quite good. And, uh, um, but they did take, uh, you know, they do updates every so often and whatnot. And uh, the, one of the up last updates, they actually turned off the, it was like a, an audio normalization. Um, so these are the part numbers. If you can see that or not, these uh, action cams are the worst, but it's an ES. These are Moog, um, you know, kind of middle of the range stuff, but uh, it's an ES140R and then an ES62L. Um, really need that stuff just quite yet. It's like the grease zerk and whatnot. And the boot, I can put that on later. But anyways, oh, cap cut. So they had this uh, audio normalization feature, but they took it away with one of the updates. So I am using a, um, a newer microphone setup than when I first started. So this is a, a DJI Action 4 camera, which I, I seem to like. It's, it's a good camera. Um, and uh, it, allows you to connect the DJI uh, mic 2 directly to the camera without having to use the um, without having to use the receiver um, which is a huge thing for me um, it's also fairly uh, fairly nice because um, it's cheaper so um, that's nice. And, uh, sorry, that was probably loud. Um, but it just is automatic. It connects to the camera. It actually retains the camera being, um, a hundred percent waterproof since it's a wireless connection. You don't have to have the receiver. Not that I do a lot in the, in the rain per se, But um, I do like that. It's pretty simple. There's not a lot of extra parts or cost. And that microphone seems to do pretty good for... I don't know. I'm getting my butt kicked by this jam nut. One of these should have been... All right. Try our last one. Sorry again. There we go. Um, 
but the audio is a little bit spikier. Um, I can, I am using the free version. Um, there is a pay version and I can get back into that. Um, I might do that at some point in the future, but, um, the free version is actually quite good. If you're just getting started, you don't want to invest a lot of money. I highly recommend the free version of CapCut. Um, it's pretty easy to use, pretty easy to learn how to use all those things. Um, so good stuff. Can't apparently talk and work left-handed threads at the same time, but we'll get it. All right, close enough for now. And everything went together nice and smooth. Didn't have to force anything, nothing got jammed, so that's good. So that's the drag link rebuilt. Got our boots and stuff over here, but we'll just go put that over by the Jeep for a second. Because the tie rod end has got to go, or the tie rod itself has got to go on first, I think. And again, so same thing, right? The part numbers are the same. Um, construction's the same. Everything's materials the same for the tie rod and drag link. Um, that was a nice bonus of doing it this way. The material wasn't, when I did it, wasn't super expensive either. You can, you can order it from like, uh, online metals, um, dot com. If you just need a couple feet, that's a, a good plan. And you could make your own tie rods at home. Uh, gotta have the taps, I guess. Those are getting pretty cheap these days though. Um, and you know, decent quality, even for the import stuff coming out of like Taiwan or whatever, plenty enough for a hobby shop type thing. So yeah, just need a taps. And I would recommend having a, I think it's a five eighths drill bit just to clean up the inside of the tube. You could do that in a vise. You don't need a lathe. I don't think um, but you can make your own tie rods for your early Jeep this way. And I think these work just fine. Like I said, I've had these on there for 12 years and I'm just replacing the tie rods now for the first time. So I can't, can't go wrong with that. And actually looking at some of these, like, um, these are probably just going to go in the at least a pair of them will go in the spare parts bag. I think I do have spares um, in there already, new spares, um, but um, yeah, I could stick another pair of those. They're still perfectly good for, for trail spares. Well, that one is getting a little, a little snug at the bottom at that point. So we won't try not to force it anymore. Mm. Well, if you have any questions on any of this stuff, you know, feel free to drop a comment below or uh, you can always send an email to, to the web store. If you got questions, that's uh, info at brennans garagecom or drop a comment below here though. That does help. I think with the YouTube algorithm stuff that, you know, the more people that comment and interact and whatnot, the better.
see if I can figure out left hand threads and talk at the same time now. some stuff here before I get too carried away. Be right back. Yeah, this one might be uh, long enough that I have to put in some music or something but hopefully it's just kind of cathodic or calming or whatever the case is uh, listen to me babble about old jeeps a little bit maybe I do like old jeeps kind of comes and goes in waves you know it's some of it's, you know, it gets, sometimes it gets kind of like clicky and there's like people, you know, and that's fine, but people do it, you know, one thing or the other with their old Jeeps and, you know, kind of, you know, the little tire guys like to hang out together and whatever. Um, I don't really have a preference as long as, you know, people can keep up. And I am kind of a little selective with who I wheel with. You know, I've, I've got a, I, I do a, a run every year, um, kind of underground thing. Uh, that's the Friday flat fender fun run where it's, uh, it's the Friday of, uh, Easter Jeep Safari. It just started out as a couple of us flat fender guys going out, um, <laughs> on the trail, uh, <laughs> and um, because essentially the, there are rules and I understand why, um, for the, uh, official event to make the trails a bit easier to manage, um, you know, certain size tires and lockers or not, or, or whatever the case is, um, wheelbase requirements on some trails and flat fenders don't fit in some of that stuff. And, uh, it's not saying that those people don't know that flat fenders can't do those trails. Um, but from the other side of things, um, if you have, if everybody's helping everybody, um, it's usually fine. But on some of those bigger organized runs, that's not the case. Like you're on some, like the official Easter Jeep runs, um, you know, you pay a fee, you expect to have, uh, some people expect to have spotters at the obstacles, um, and things like that. And sometimes, uh, it's a little bit more handholding, uh, people are a little, uh, less experienced and so may or may not be a good, um, fit, I guess, you know, uh, having, Sometimes, you know, when you have 25, 50 vehicles on a trail, it can just be too much work if the vehicles aren't capable enough. And the vehicle can be capable enough and the driver can't also, but, um, you know, we kind of pick our battles that way. But uh, anyways, so I started doing this flatty run thing and now it's, it's kind of turned into this crazy thing. And, uh, you know, 50, 50 flat fenders of, of questionable origin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some guys are buying them when they're just coming down, uh, to the event and running them, you know, green unproven. That's pretty cool. And there's a lot of like stalker guys that come out and then there's like, it's, it's basically all the flat fenders. I won't say everyone, but it's the majority of flat fenders in Moab show up this day, uh, during Easter Jeep. And it, it's a lot of different people. And, um, it's so many people that I have a group of guys, um, 
that have been doing it a lot that are kind of like my go-to um, helpers, uh, and they they take care of the um, the problems along the way. And all I have to do is is go. Um, you know, I try and keep everybody together as much as I can, but then I also try to keep everybody moving as much as I can and eliminate, you know, being on the trail t till you know. 1230 in the morning or whatever some <laughs> we've had that happen before um, so yeah it was just one of those one of those things but uh I I really like the flat fender I like flat fender community um, it does have its pluses and minuses and ups and downs and stuff like that but um, you know, it is still and always has been one of the best groups of people that I have worked with um, and wheeled with and stuff like that. So that's kind of my go-to uh, when I can. And then... Uh, But I like, you know, Flat Fender community has always been really good to me. Um, you know, supporting my little shop and uh, all those kinds of things. And even in that community it's you know there's there's a difference like we've done you know runs up like lower hell dorado and stuff with the with a uh, a group of mixed vehicles a smaller group you know call it maybe 20 but you, you start to see like if you get on the really hard trails um you know uh it is harder for the small tower guys and it should be, uh, but they, they start to have more, more problems and stuff. Um, but it's, it's not that they can't do it. Um, they eventually make it or they may have to winch or something. That's fine. Um, But yeah, it's generally a really good group of people. And if you have to start somewhere, I would recommend starting with a flat fender. I wouldn't, I'd say do it for two people. Don't plan on putting, you know, if you got kids and stuff like that, maybe buy more than one. Um, it is, uh, they are uh, quite small comparatively to most modern vehicles. So be careful that way. But other than that, you can build a very capable one very easily pretty cheaply you can do it in a garage with limited tools it doesn't have to be fancy um, yeah so that is the good part about flat fendering and they're pretty easy to work on parts are pretty simple
really I haven't I haven't had to change much on this old thing. I could change stuff and I'm not saying that I won't in the future, but in reality for what I, when I built it, how I built it, all those things, like I really didn't, didn't change much. It's not really fancy either. Um, so that's kind of nice sometimes. pretty easy to work on and I mean this one is is like super I mean this is still carbureted manual transmission all that kind of stuff so I don't think it gets much simpler than that And honestly, that does the job pretty darn well. There are some little tricks along the way, and I think I've shared a lot of that with the build thread for this Jeep, and I'll continue to share some of that stuff, you know, kind of like how to make tie rods that are cheap and easy and work well. Stuff like that. I almost forgot to put the tie rod boots on. Yeah, I think these old, these old Jeeps, I mean, I wish I could, and I could, I guess, if, you know, it's not free or anything, but, um, you know, I mean, people out there buying, buying side-by-sides for, geez, I don't even know these days, right? Like, there, there's some of them that are $30,000, um, and I get it, they're, they're fun, um, different kind of fun than, than an old flat fender, for sure. I think there's some ways you could close the gap up there a little bit, and maybe, you know, make a flat fender do some side-by-side -side things a little bit better um, but they are different but I think you could I do think these um, tend to last a lot longer um, I do see some you know side-by-side -side stuff and maybe it's just because they come up with new stuff every every so you know every couple years they're always coming up with something new but I just don't see the durability um, long term, you know, some of these, I don't, I mean, maybe we will, but I don't see any, any, uh, side by sides out there that are, that are 70, 80 years old now. And I know they weren't around back then, but you know what I mean? Like, I do think it's a testament to these old Jeeps, how long they've been around and how well they do work, generally speaking. I think if you take care of them a little bit and whatever that may be that they'll last even longer and they'll be around when it's a hundred and that's pretty cool And then you can pass it on to somebody else and they can build it and play with it and whatever else. I don't think, I don't think we'll be seeing that with the, with the UTVs. Maybe we will. I don't know.
you build yourself a flatty. Heck, these days, just build one from scratch. I built the frame for this one in a two-car garage with when I hardly had any tools at all. It wasn't that hard. There's blueprints for it out there. Buy a reproduction tub. That way you don't have to find a survivor. Like we were talking about before, just a V6 and a granny four speed, Dana 18. Do some, I would do some slightly upgraded axles like this narrow track 30 front. A wide track 30 front would actually be a really, really good one. Um, I think it would give you a little bit more steering angle um, with the big tires. And then like uh, this one's got a full float Dana 44 rear in it. That's a really good option for these things. But there's a ton of different stuff out there. Toyota axles, um, Isuzu axles, Montero axle. Um, there's a ton of parts that can be used that might not be perfect and whatever, but I think they're, they are still good parts. Parts is parts with these old things, in my opinion. Just use what you can find that's in your budget and uh, go from there. This one's, you know, got like the raised fenders and some other stuff like that, but that's all pretty cheap stuff. You know, it was just time more than anything. But eventually in the end, you just get a big kid go-kart that you can also, one of the other things is you can drive them on the you can drive these on the street. In a lot of places, you can't drive side-by-sides on the street. So that's another win, in my opinion, for side-by-sides, or against side-by-sides. A win for, win for old Jeeps. Drive these down the interstate if you want. I mean, you'll get passed by a lot of people, but that's fine. I don't see people getting... One interesting thing is I think... Uh, I think flat fenders kind of get a pass from a lot of people. Um, they're old and cool and everybody kind of likes them and all those things and... Uh, I think people just kind of realize that they kind of go slow so they aren't expecting you to be going, you know, 80 down the interstate. I'd recommend staying off the interstate as much as you can, of course, uh, but if you have to get on there for a short stretch or something or whatever, you seem to get a little bit. Three cirques are never fun threads. I don't know, tapered, little tapered threads. Just never really seem to bite that good.
doesn't like old Jeeps? Even people who don't like them kind of still like them. I mean, I understand they're not the most practical thing. And, you know, sometimes you got a family or whatever the case. But, I mean, it's hard not to like an old Jeep, I guess, is what I'm saying. And now you can build them from scratch. I mean, that's pretty cool. Hard to do that with. I mean, Jeeps are pretty well supported that way, but like this is one of the easiest vehicles to do that with. These are pretty simple things. So. And I think by keeping the tire size, I mean, there's a lot of people that run smaller tires than I do, of course, you know, like the, the more locker stucker guys. And if that's what you're into, that's cool. Um, I find the 37, or I find, oh, sorry, I can't talk and try and thread things with concentration, apparently at the same time. I find that a 35 inch tire is a really good all around compromise for some of that. Um, specifically, and one of the reasons why I built this was 35s are the smallest size you can do ultimate adventure with. And so that was definitely on my bucket list. And man, this one's being stubborn. So that was kind of a driver for why to do the 35s and uh, playing in the snow, definitely more fun with the 35s. Um, sand, more fun with the 35s. It does make a difference on the rock trails. Um, like I said before, like we've done mixed runs and it is apparent at some point how much harder it is with smaller tires. And if that's your thing and that's what you want to do, that's fine. But I do like having a kind of a balance there. Difficult, but I'm not having to beat the vehicle to death, um, you know, to the point that I break the frame in half. Start, sorry, Stan. Um, you know, and just completely destroy the body. Um, I like the, I think one of the benefits that's underrated is the wide tires do keep the rocks off of the body a little bit better and that is why this thing has kind of stayed the same look man i might have to give up on that one and just find a take one out of the other spare parts or something So for me, the 35s were a good balance. It's not, you're not having to get into the one ton stuff yet. Uh, Dana 44 and 35s or even a Dana 30. And 35s is still possible in these. They are light enough that it's definitely possible. That's annoying. That one is a slightly different size. I think the threads are the same, but the hex is different. Well, ah. does annoy me that one of the grease zerks is going to be a different thread, but, or a different hex.
All right, so now everything's kind of back in. Ooh, hey, you're watching that tire there. I must have got you for a minute, but I think my battery's gonna die. So let me change the battery in this thing. And I'll bring you back for more rambling by Brennan. All right, bye. Well, it appears that my mic battery is uh, dead, dying, whatever. I gotta charge that. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but I hope you like following along um, with this. Uh, I'll probably just let this kind of run out in the background a little bit. Um, but yeah, thanks for following along. If you have any questions, drop a comment below. All I really got to left do on this is just uh, make some fine adjustments with the, uh, the numbers that we wrote down on the bumper um, for kind of the alignment, if you will. And uh, that's about all. So pretty easy maintenance thing probably only took a you know hour or so or whatever but uh pretty easy and it was nice talking to you guys along the way and so uh, if you have any questions drop a comment in the bottom and if you like this kind of stuff on the channel you know let me know give me a thumbs up uh whatever and um yeah we'll catch you on the next one hopefully uh i guess one of the reasons why i'm doing this is uh I'm going to take this on a weekend trip with some friends um, and uh, hopefully get some video of uh, the old flatty out in the wild doing some stuff and uh, document a little bit of that trip. So thanks for following along. We'll catch you on the next one. And uh, yeah, bye. <music>
Oh, you guys are still here? All right, I'm done. We'll talk to you later. Bye.